played on an apparent shooting at Columbine High School in Jefferson County. It just doesn't seem like 20 years could have passed. It seems, it seems like it was yesterday. It's hard to believe it's gonna be 20 years. He's gonna be talking about the unthinkable. I could not carry on a conversation looking eye to eye because I had so much guilt. If I went to family function, I did not want to be around people. Every day is better than the last, right? Everyone would always ask me, do you have any questions? And I'd same question every time because nobody gave me a direct answer. And it was, am I going to walk again? Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, begin by saying that uh, we all know there has been a terrible shooting. I hope the American people will be praying for the students, the parents, and the teachers. I couldn't hang my head any longer. It was so disrespectful to Lauren, and it was so disrespectful to all of the 13. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to make a difference and to keep this community strong. And as a parent now, I just, it's hard to realize what my dad went through that day. And I didn't think anything of it until I became a parent. And how, how my parents must have felt that day. Sean Thomas Graves. He made that his personal goal, and he kept at it like I did for a couple of years, and he kept pushing himself, and sure enough, at graduation, he got out of his wheelchair and he walked. And he gave me credit for him having the courage to do that. We had that day in which we lost our kids and people were injured, we were impacted, but Columbine also represents hope and what we were able to overcome, and not necessarily moving forward, but healing. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building. At least killed the of the Murrow Federal Building, looking for survivors among the close to 200 people. When I first came down here that day, it was it was like a war zone. And glass everywhere, and people just wandering around. I felt it. I felt the bombing. My office is five or six miles from here, and you could feel the blast, you know, up to 50 miles away. And we, we knew something bad had happened, but then, then we found out that it was an actual attack. The United States will not tolerate. This is a tragedy that hit in the heart of the United States. The chaos in downtown Oklahoma City did indeed resemble Beirut after what police believe to be a 1,200-pound car bomb. It's an American elm. It's a native tree in Oklahoma. Now, the cars, when they caught fire, they did were pushed up all the way uh, up to the base of the tree here, and fire scorched this whole side of the tree. Somebody first called it the survivor tree, and uh, it's, it's just amazing to me that, that this tree was able to survive in a parking lot, uh, and then not only the, the terrible blast that happened, uh, and then pass that too. All right, if you guys could come in, please. This side of the bar, did it get charred? So this side was not charred. You see all of this through here, this black, is where the tree had been charred. And so it kind of came through here but this side was, was okay. You can see here, out on the very tips, the little small flower petals are starting to come out. And those seeds then, the memorial staff here will collect all those seeds as they drop. They just need to be planted. And usually within a week to 10 days, we've got thousands of little seedlings. One thing I'd like to point out is that saplings of this tree have been sent to uh, many places across the states and so, not only does she stand here as a representation of the tenacity of Oklahomans, 
She has little saplings everywhere that are growing to represent the tenacity of everybody to survive things like this. Coming up to the tree and touching it, you get a sense of the strength that, that you have also. I believe it's shown how our family has grown in the last 20 years. And it gradually went from this size pot to this size pot to a bigger pot. We're very proud that Dowers is thriving and I love the connection from one state to another. They shared their pain, they reached out, and we have it now growing as a special memory and connection with our family. Her goal was to make somebody smile every day, and she did that. I dropped her off in the front of the school and I watched her walk all the way into the school. And the last thing that I said and did was this. Uh, which is sign language for I love you. This is what we did all the time in my family. And it was the last thing we always said, I love you. So hand out the window, I love you, honey. And she waved, I love you. And that was the last I saw her that day. It just, it just had to be done. She's earned this diploma. We're gonna go pick it up for her. I look at those pictures now. I'm not quite sure I can believe we were standing up and doing that. The applause for Lauren on that morning was something that'll stick with me forever. Um, and it was the Columbine community reaching out and saying, you know, we love you and we love your family. It's a memory of Lauren. Every time we look at it, it's, you know, a beacon of survival. We have grown, obviously, since April of 99. Our family has grown with two new grandkids, with another grandkid on the way. And that's what, that's what I want people to look at us and just say, you know, we're extending our branches. We're here, we're giving you this warmth and love and you can't tell what we've been through. That'd be I pretty like cool. That. I like that. That's not bad. That's real good. <laughs> I think it really was a wake-up call for all of us. So I think all of our lives changed, not only in the Columbine community, but around the country, around the world. I always, I'm one of those, I want to be here in plenty of time. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's going to be 20 years. I was in San Francisco, in uh, Duluth, in Anaheim this week, Anaheim next week, Buffalo, Cincinnati, and I finished up in Jackson, Mississippi at a, at a superintendent's conference. I can talk about the aftermath, what to deal with, things that you never expect. And I can remember two days after the tragedy, you know, Father said to me, Frank, you know, there's a good chance you could have lost your life, but God spared you now. You need to go rebuild that community, and you don't have to walk that journey alone. Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hello, how are you? Good, good. So, Mr. Frank DeAngelis, help me welcome you. But when I get up on stage and when I start my presentation, I have an individual picture of each of the 13. Cassie Bernal, Stephen Kernow, Corey DePooter, Kelly Fleming. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my beloved 13. Matt Kector. They walked into Columbine High School at about 7 a.m. on April 20th. Daniel Mauser. And never returned home. Danny Rohrbach. The kids that you see up here, they would no longer be kids. Sanders. 
They're 37 and 38 year old adults and they died in my school. Rachel Scott. Isaiah Scholl. Bringing you up to date on an apparent shooting at Columbine High School. John Tomlin. This all started about 40 minutes ago. Lauren Townsend. Responded from all over the metropolitan area. We have Kyle Velasquez. And the first thing that crossed my mind is this has to be a senior prank. And then all of a sudden, I run out of my office, and from here to the back of this room, I see a gunman coming towards me. Dave Sanders came out of the faculty lounge, and as he was coming towards the hallway, the gunman caught him out of the corner of his eye. He turned around and shot Dave through the back of the head. He crawled down the hallway until a teacher came and dragged him into a classroom. And he was in that classroom for three and a half hours before paramedics came in. The day after, I went in to the uh, superintendent's office and the school board. I met with them before I met with the students and parents, and I, I offered to resign. I said, these kids died on my watch. My name is John DeStefano and I'm president of the Board of Education of Jefferson County. And of course, Frank DeAngelis. Frank and I were on the way to the meeting with the Columbine staff that morning. He said to me, I am so sorry to let you and the district down. I failed my students and my community. How can anyone ever trust me with their children again? I could not carry on a conversation looking eye to eye because I had so much guilt. If I went to family function, I did not want to be around people. And you continue to be a source of strength for me and for everyone else in our community. And in more ways than you know, Frank. And I want to thank you for that. They graduate on May 22nd over at Fiddler's Green and one of the most heartwarming is Lauren Townsend was a valedictorian. Sorry. To have Bruce and Dawn there to accept a diploma on her behalf and knowing that she was looking down on us and that's that when that healing started. goes back to Santee. I met with the people from Red Lakes, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, Chardon, Parkland, Marshall County in Benton, Kentucky, Great Mills High School, also Santa Fe. Hey Ty, how are you? Oh good. So what are you, what are you guys doing today? So how, how's uh, the community doing? You'll start noticing some things when this is over. And so, you know, take care, take care of your family and you. It's important. Text me later today and let me know how everything goes, okay? Uh, and if you need anything, let me know. Okay, Ty, thank you so much, bye. There is nothing we can do to bring back the 13 but I'm going to make sure that they do not die in vain. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to make a difference and to keep this community strong. When I got the job here, it is 
so different from any other school. My senior year of college, I just kind of had this epiphany that I wanted to be a school counselor and create a safe space for kids. When I decided that I wanted to be a teacher, there was never any thought that it was going to be anywhere but Columbine. It just feels, feels like home. Ryder, do you see Clayton? He's on his bike over there. It's just a weird, fun happenstance. But then to find out that we live in the same neighborhood is really cool too. Ryder, careful. Man, every day is different. Man, look at these two. I know. They're buds. But you're also having like a ton of fun with kids. Those are my favorite teaching days. Mm -hmm. Those are the best. Yeah. You get to witness their dreams coming together. So it's a really cool job. I love it. Yep, set, go. And I did not expect my journey to bring me back to Columbine, but it's been really powerful because it feels like I'm coming full circle. It didn't affect me as much as it has until I became a mom. And then we heard what it sounded like, girls screaming. The fire alarm rang. One of my best friends came out and said, Mandy, we have to go, they're shooting. And I said, who's shooting? I was in a math class um, as well. Got out fairly quickly when the fire alarm went off. And I remember hearing a particular teacher yelling at us to run, you gotta get out of here. And that was the first moment I really felt like I was in danger. Yeah, so uh, I was a freshman. Um, I was in the art classroom, which is about as safe and far away as you could be. The fire alarm went off, and I think we kind of all thought it was uh, either an alarm or a senior prank. So I was in the math department, and I heard some raised voices out in the hall. And then the fire alarm gets pulled. I remember looking down at my desk and thinking what I wanted to take outside with me as I was, I mean, not taking the fire drill very seriously. It took days to find out yeah. what had really happened. Even for those of us that were here, it took days. We went home, and that's when you turned on the news. Yeah, I remember getting home around dinner time and watching news for <laughs> the next 24 hours. Days. But I remember going home and just being in a daze for days, trying to figure out which way was up. Now I'm dealing with kids that weren't even born. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of curiosity about what happened and, and you know, the, the, the events surrounding it and, and the events coming after it. Every year I give my students a survey and they get to ask me, anything. My spiel is always like I was here as a student and they eventually catch on around the time period. They're, they're just trying to reconcile my experiences with what they've heard in the media or what they've heard from friends or, or kids or from other parents. schools, parents, right. yeah. that kind of stuff. And I saw my dad, my dad picked me up and he hugged me so tight I had to tell him to let go because I couldn't breathe. Um, and I still didn't hit me. I, I still didn't understand what was going on. I was 16, you know, how much could I understand? My dad found me and I was wearing a dress that day because it was a track day and we always dressed up for sports and he wouldn't let go. And as a parent now, I just, it's hard to realize what my dad went through that day. And I didn't think anything of it until I became a parent. And how, how my parents must have felt that day. And years later, years later, I went to both of my parents and said, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry the way I acted because now I get it. Now I get it. strength in my legs. Uh, as of right now, most of the muscles in my legs are working. You don't look for long-range goals. Just look for achievable goals. As long as you do that. But I need to uh, do more physical therapy before I'll know if I'll walk. Stop. I can't. <laughs> I had a lot of anger at Craig. <laughs> God. <laughs> God, I can't walk. Then sit down. I don't want to sit down. I got to do this. For me? <laughs> no, for myself. Just getting into the reality that there was that, there was that good possibility I'd never walk again. So I was 15 years old, April 20th of 99. I was a freshman and I was shot six times in total. Everyone would always ask me, do you have any questions? And I, same question every time because nobody gave me a direct answer. And it was, am I gonna walk again? They can never tell me, yes, you're gonna walk again or no, you're not. So I made it my goal. Sean Thomas. Graves. I made graduation my end date, that I was going to retire that wheelchair. I was nervous. Um, I was up on stage, and I had it all planned out in my mind. And I've practiced it on my own, in my bedroom, standing up from my bed, over and over and over, trying to make sure that I had it down pat. Sean Thomas Graves. I was trying to prove a point that if you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything. When I accepted my diploma, I just, I, it's hard to explain. I just, I knew I, that goal's done. And at the same time, I didn't know what was next, but I, I knew I wasn't taking that wheelchair out. And, Against everyone's wishes, I walked out of there. You know, it's very rural. You know, everybody knows everybody. You have to because you run into everybody downtown <laughs> every day, so. How would I describe Ryan? Well, he's extremely positive, very competitive, and he just wants to excel. I always liked having the ball in my hands, playing ball. Ask him if he still loves the game of basketball. I know what his answer will be. I remember it was, it was a nice sunny day. We didn't have any school that day, and the, the car just it flipped. I blacked out. I woke up, and I was in a hospital bed. Let's see. He'd never been one to sit and sit still. He just always on the go doing something. Yeah, so this is our last picture of Ryan before he got hurt. I pulled up and the ambulance was already there. I said, where's Ryan? And he said he's in the ambulance. So I jumped in the ambulance and rode to the hospital with him. First thing he said to me is, Dad, I can't feel my legs. So four to three staples. That was to reconstruct his 12th vertebrae. We needed to learn how to get in and out of a car, even in and out of bed, getting dressed. You know, going in, we was 
I was scared to death how, how we were going to do it, you know. My mom just said, you know, this guy who was shot six times was wanting to come talk to me. He was 15 when, like, he got hurt too. I said, all right, I'm like, yeah, let's go for it. So we went and talked to him, and I think we were there for a good hour, hour and a half, and he asked, you know, how did you do it? I kind of explained to him, you know, you, just get, you gotta believe in yourself. So I remember when we left Craig that day that Sean was like, Ryan's not ready to hear what I have to say, and you know, he's, he's just, he's, it's too new. We knew that he was starting to get some feeling back. And he said, maybe I'll be like Sean. When I turned senior, I was like, all right, well, this, this could be possible. You know, I could, I could do this. I could do it. You know, Sean did it. Why can't I? I don't know if many people knew he was going to do it. I knew it was very important to him. I was up very early that morning because I couldn't sleep. And then about 8 o'clock, the phone rang. And I saw it was from Ryan. But I was like, I, I want to do this. Can you help me? And he just matter of factly said, listen, we talked the school into letting me do this. If we could have somebody help me backstage, put my braces on, and then be there with me on the stage. A special moment that I'll never, ever forget. Ryan A. Tyler. And it was instant. It was very special. He just said, are you ready for this? And I said, yeah, I think so. It's one of those moments in your life you can't ever duplicate because of all the emotion and all the work. Just for that one step, it will stay with me forever. Somehow my mother-in-law had a client from Nebraska who had a newspaper and happened to come across an article. And sure enough, at graduation, he got out of his wheelchair and he walked. In the article, he said it was because of a visit um, that he got inspired, it was from me, and he gave me credit for him having the courage to do that. I carried that article around in my wallet for years, actually. It was a somber reminder of, of where I came from and the fact that I always told myself that if I could... Sean Thomas Graves. If I could help just one person, then, you know, it was all for, it was all worth it. I find it hard to wrap my mind around it. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like 20 years could have passed. Seems like it was yesterday. When we lost Kelly, the whole block rallied around us. I mean, they were with us every step of the way. And so it wasn't us, it was, it was really them. She had so much ahead of her. She was looking forward to learning to drive a car and a first job, and, uh, and she was just finding her way. Hi, Kelly. Hi. I checked your bedroom. You got a lot of groovy stuff in there. I just love to, to, to watch and see her, be able to see her as she was. You know, she uh, she was just on the brink of so many things. <laughs> Kelly Survivor. 
can be a famous novelist someday, won't you? Hopefully, you will be. It's just nice to be able to hear her voice, see her, and know that she was. She was a gift, definite gift. So this was a little book that was sent to us right after Kelly died, and uh, it's from a 14-year-old girl, and she wrote us just this lovely little letter in here. She said, I'm 14 years old and live in Jamestown, New, New York. This photo album is for you to keep all your special memories of Kelly inside. What happened to you was so terrible, I can't even begin to imagine what it must feel like. No one should ever have to go through something like that. She didn't deserve to die so young. Stay strong and keep Kelly's legacy alive. I know you will get through this. You are in my prayers and I love you. I have lots of little Kelly, Kelly Annie pictures in here, and so they kind of go from when she was itty bitty. Halloween was her favorite holiday. How old was she then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Probably five. Yeah. We still get letters from individuals saying how Kelly inspired them in one way or another, and I know all the other families do as well. Each child brought something different and they touched uh, different people across the, the United States and the world. Mm -hmm. We feel like she's, she's, she's still close. Mm -hmm. We have certain signs that we know she sends that we recognize and uh, it kind of all started on her 17th birthday out at the cemetery. I was just asking God for a sign that she was A-OK -okay, and right before we left the cemetery I got this bubbling of rainbow of colors in the clouds and it was kind of pastels and pinks and I took it I said that's my sign. <laughs> Some people will say yeah they're coincidences. We like to believe they're not and that may make us crazy but so what we're not hurting <laughs> anybody. She loved to write. Writing was her thing. She wrote a lot of short stories, a lot of experiences that she had. Um, so we're really grateful for those. How to stop it. I know she was smiling down and super happy that people were reading something she wrote. We do feel that Kelly is still somewhere. We think she's in a great place. Columbine happened. Columbine. 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 And I asked one of the ladies that worked there, I said, what are these? And she said, well, they are little saplings from the survivor tree at Oklahoma. New life extended. Every spring. Mm -hmm. But it's not a bad feeling, it's a warm feeling. It's a great feeling, that connection. We become wonderful friends with so many people. As part of a group that we hate being members of, it has just thrived there. I talk about her in, in the present, who she is, who they are, because they're with us. They were living, breathing, beautiful, kind people. Well, I want you to think back to 20 years ago. Was everyone born 20 years ago? I want to make sure. <laughs> It took me leaving to realize that this is where I belonged all along, that this was, this was home. I was lucky to A, be alive, 
which I didn't always see it that way in the beginning. It took me a while to get past that. I'm blessed to be where I am now. <laughs> so she would hardly ever smile, but they got one picture of her smiling. Well, it seems that moving on is like leaving things behind. And we haven't left Kelly behind. She's been every bit along the way with us through all these years. I think my heart's bigger now. I've said before that there's a hole in my heart. It's a big one that was placed there on April 20th. And the hole hasn't gotten any smaller. I don't expect it ever to. But I make it a goal to do something every day to make my heart bigger so that the hole in my heart doesn't seem so huge.